itself. And you talk a lot about community and people don't often think that there's really a marketing aspect to the work. And so that solidified that, you know, some of the best marketing work is actually marketing work that's driving business and purpose. Welcome to the Smart Talk series, the show for professionals who want strategies, tips, and real talk about all things PR, marketing, and social media. Your host is Melissa Vela Williamson, an award-winning, accredited, and nationally recognized PR pro and communication thought leader. And now your host, Melissa Vela Williamson. Hello, and welcome to the Smart Talk series. I'm Melissa Vela Williamson. This season, our focus is on communication trailblazers. Today, I'm joined by Cherie Barros. Cherie is an award-winning brand executive with a body of work spanning 20 years across some of the most recognized sports entertainment brands. She currently serves as a vice president of global sports brand alliances for the American Cancer Society. At the intersection of corporate social responsibility and cause marketing, she leads a team managing partnerships with major sports leagues, brands, and talent to advance their mission. Welcome, Cherie. Well, thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm so glad you're here. We met many, many moons ago in a leadership program when you were based out of San Antonio. Catch me up and tell our listeners a little bit more about your background and your work today. Yeah, so it's so great to talk to you again, Melissa. Truly enjoyed my time in San Antonio with the Spurs. And as far as my background, I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia, left Atlanta to go to college at Florida State, found myself in Texas twice in my career after that. I got my master's in Dallas at University of North Texas, and then years later found my way back to Texas and San Antonio, where I led marketing with the San Antonio Spurs. So there's a lot more in between there, but essentially since leaving the Spurs, I've moved into brand partnerships on the sports marketing side and really thrilled to be with the American Cancer Society managing partnerships now on the nonprofit side. Absolutely. What a great evolution of your career and some of your passions. So let's talk about how you got your start in sports marketing. Was that a linear passion? <laughs> Yes. Uh, so not necessarily. I, I always like to start out by saying that my inspiration really for my career started very young. And when I was growing up in Atlanta, Georgia, a young girl whose father loved the Atlanta Braves and watched sports in general, I then connected with him, you know, and became a huge Atlanta Braves fan growing up but never really saw sports as a career. So it wasn't until going to Florida State and really being encouraged to get an internship before graduating, I found myself at a career fair. And the only job experience I had at that point was a part-time job I had working for the Atlanta Braves at Turner Field. And PGA Tour recruiter stopped me and said, wait a minute, let me see your resume. And we actually have a diversity internship program where we're working to get more diverse people into the business side of golf at that point. It was the height of Tiger Woods' success and credit to the PGA Tour for recognizing that they should diversify the business side. So it was really something that found me just in terms of looking at sports as a career as a result of that internship. And at that point, I was way too far along getting my psychology degree at that point at Florida State going into my senior year. But that internship with the PGA Championship, which was in Atlanta, 11th largest sporting event in the world at the time, was really what inspired me to pursue sports as a career. I love that. And I love how you mentioned what you studied in college. I'm sure the psychology that you studied in college helps in your career today, but you also share a great story, Sheree, about how some of it was just perfect timing, being in the right place. And growing off that part-time job you have, I often tell college students, don't worry so much about, you know, I've talked to some just yesterday who were really concerned about, what if I don't find that right first job? And I'm like, that's like a first draft of your career story. <laughs> and often like you did, the part-time jobs you have while you're in high school or college can really give you insight into what you may want to do, open your eyes or really show you what you don't want to do. Yeah, that's exactly what I tell students whenever I've been privileged to speak to students over the course of my career. And it is, it's just as much about learning what you don't want to do, which was certainly my path, as what you do want to do. And I was fortunate to get some advice early on that as many internships as you can do before you are really in need of finding something full-time, you should do that. So 
I think the academic world could probably turn off their ears when I say this, but I more went to grad school to have that extra time to intern than for the academic master's itself. And so having that insight from those that were looking to get into sports, going to a lot of career fairs at that point between undergrad and grad school, I heard a lot and often that, you know, usually takes two, three, maybe more internships before you find yourself in a full-time job opportunity. So grad school was really strategic for me to give me that amount of time to intern just as much as actually learning the discipline of sports. I really understand that as a grad student, I found myself saying, you never have the kind of leverage that you have when you're a college student. Mm -hmm. And so you have that opportunity and people are willing to give you that advice. They're willing to let you shadow, let you volunteer. You get these experiences that you won't get once you're a working professional. So I just want to underline what you said is very key, you know, for some of our working pros that are listening, they might want to consider a little more continuing education because of that leverage. If they want to try something new and they're having some kind of barriers that are blocking them from trying that. So I think that's a great point that you make there. Thanks. So at this point in your career, I mean, you've had such a great experience and it's all noteworthy. And now you're doing some wonderful cause marketing for a organization that you really care about. So you have this expertise in creating these cause marketing campaigns and partnerships. And partnerships are something that has been a through line in my career where we're always looking to collaborate and especially nonprofits are looking for partnerships. And with some of the big organizations and brands that you have relationships with, I'm sure they ask you about that all the time. So what should communicators know about building successful partnerships? Yeah, it's a great question. I would say I've had the privilege of coming to the nonprofit partnership space from the for-profit partnership space. So in that order, um, learning really the business of partnerships from the perspective of after I left the Spurs, ended up with a sports agency in Atlanta where I represented corporate clients who were looking to sponsor and pay for sponsorships with various sports teams and leagues. So approaching it from the perspective of really being the client of the teams and the leagues to now them being my client, so to speak, on the nonprofit side, because it's the reverse where the leagues are actually funding us and the great impact work that we're doing to help save lives at the American Cancer Society. So the understanding of partnerships from a for-profit perspective has been tremendous in just really guiding my approach to partnerships on the nonprofit side. You understand, again, that the beauty of partnerships is that both brands are coming together. One brand is helping another and the same is happening on the other side. That being said, you know, certainly the person that's actually helping to fund whatever the cause is or drive business on the opposite side for the company, that person really is the lead and they're wanting to ensure that wherever they're investing their dollars, that they're getting the results out of it. So I think the key with partnerships is first, do the brands align? And then second, are the objectives being met really on both sides, but particularly for whichever entity is investing in the other? Yeah, I think those are really important two key points that you make there about that brand alignment as that foundational point, right? That if they're not a fit, if this doesn't speak to their giving pillars of what they care about as an organization, their values, I've seen nonprofits try to, what we would call in the agency world, like scope creep, right? You don't do mentoring. You don't naturally do these things. Don't add a new program to try to attract the money or funding that may come from that if it's inauthentic to what you do and who you serve. And I would say that the major brands you work with can probably sense that right away. Yeah, and that's what I'll say just to kind of go another layer is it's exactly right. And again, the reason for the brand alignment is really from a nonprofit perspective, our partnerships are driven by the impact that we're able to make in the community. And are we actually able to measure that and show the difference that we're making? And a credit to our sports league partners, National Football League we've partnered with for 14 years now, National Hockey League, we're going into six seasons with them, NBA, WTA. We're fortunate to have a really amazing portfolio of league partners and all of whom I would say are squarely focused on the impact that they're able to make through us. So from a communications perspective, it directly connects to not only how are we doing the work, but how are we translating that into impact and how are we communicating that to the audiences that we're reaching through these sports leagues. So it's really central to all of the work that we do. And we're pushed from year to year to go another layer. So again, one of the things I love about being 
in the social responsibility space, especially in today's day and age, where we have real serious critical issues that we're working through as a society and really globally. It's being able to take that piece of the pie and, and that opportunity that's directly within your impact zone and really hone in on it. So for example, with our NFL partnership, we focus on the prevention side of cancer and trying to save lives by getting more people to catch it early or to do risk reduction behaviors, uh, which are obviously directly connected to health and which sports entities have a unique ability to influence. So being able to focus on that prevention area with the NFL and how many more people are we helping to get screened this month alone with Crucial Catch being the focus area for the NFL's cause work in October, we're really able to send that message through PSAs and digital content and again, PR and press around highlighting the work that healthcare providers and patients are doing in each market around the country where the NFL has a presence. So it's really being able to focus on specific areas. National Hockey League is focused on access to care and providing patients with those extra resources to be able to complete their treatment, like our Hope Lodge, where you can stay for free in treatment. So what's really been helpful for us just in establishing these partnerships in the nonprofit space is working with each partner on what specific side of cancer. Cancer is a massive, obviously, area to tackle. How can we get more granular and specific with each partner on what part of that they want to have be their focus area? I love that example, Sheree, because as you walked us through it, I could almost see that spectrum of care of where you may start as someone who's newly diagnosed and what kind of resources are there for you and then who's powering those resources. So that's fantastic. I love that approach. And I also really want to point out that you had called the partnership and you use the term client. And I think that that's really special because what it highlights for me is that you have to have accountability and ownership to that relationship once that partnership is created. Too often I've seen where a nonprofit will get the funding and then they check the box and they're on to the next funder, the next opportunity, and know you have that responsibility to really live up to every part of that partnership agreement that you put together to even have a memorandum of understanding in the first place, right? But then like you mentioned, like a client is making sure that you're really buttoned up. I mean, you've worked with some of the best professional teams around the globe, and you probably know better than anyone that, you know, it's the little things. It's the little things like not being consistent with your brand expression, not being consistent with your messaging, not having good relations with your community as the nonprofit. Those are some of the very fundamental things you're probably looking for. But, you know, with your eye on this top tier professional sports team brand alignment, what has led you, do you think, personally into this level of marketing? And are there any tips from that experience you can share with us if we'd like to work with the NBA or NFL one day? Yeah, so I think it really goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is that trial and error in your career. And we were speaking from the interim perspective before you start working full time, but that process doesn't stop. Even once you're full time in your career, and I've certainly experienced this in my career, and been fortunate to be in an area like marketing where there are so many different channels of marketing as a whole to focus on. But I continued my trial and error through my first full-time opportunity with the Atlanta Falcons where I spent four years and was able to really test, so to speak, by virtue of doing several different aspects of marketing discipline. I actually interned with the Texas Rangers in grad school in community and player relations. So have ended up back in that full circle back in that area. But then moving to the Falcons, I started out in grassroots marketing and setting up experiential events and, and player tours and really extending the brand and then moved into game and event operations, being on the field, testing out, you know, if you go to a game and you see the features that are coming in and out of the breaks, being able to work in that division and test out that skill set. Then deciding that with my psych background, I was really intrigued by brand marketing and advertising and being able to shift into that area, ultimately through the Raiders onto the San Antonio Spurs, where I really more so focused on the advertising and the media marketing side of the team. So that evolution of trial and error, I would definitely say is what's helped me in my career, always that by virtue of doing, seeing what was it really that spoke to me. And what I found was that 
being a psychology major originally was that intrigue and that interest in people and influencing behavior. And what I love about partnerships is it's taking one brand and their goals and objectives and target audience, and it's aligning it with the best brand for them to achieve their objectives. So by landing on what discipline and what aspect of marketing really intrigued me the most, it led me to knowing that the brand side was what I wanted to be on. And I think partnerships is a pretty good reflection of brand alignment and brand strategy. And then as far as nonprofit, whenever anyone would ask me with the teams what my favorite part of the job was, it would always be the community side of what we did. And I worked obviously in marketing for tickets and, and other purposes, but the community appearances and working with our foundations at the various teams were always the favorite part of what I did. So I knew that that was certainly one of the things that inspired me the most about the marketing work I was doing. And then the way things happen in life, it still didn't dawn on me to look at nonprofit. But fortunately, when I left the sports agency here in Atlanta, a colleague at that agency reached out to me and he moved to the American Cancer Society. So I like to share that because it really was something that found me. But knowing what I was most passionate about helped guide me toward it and helped me pursue it and say yes when that colleague reached out and said, I have a great opportunity. So I didn't necessarily write this down as my career trajectory, which I think it's important for people to hear. Um, but by knowing myself and, and knowing what I was most passionate about with the work that I was able to do over the past 10 plus years, working for teams and then agency, it helped me feel confident in the decision to say yes, because it checked those boxes of what I enjoyed the most about what I do. Yeah, I mean, and it sounds very strategic, even though some of this evolution in our careers may not be intentional. Exactly. Because if you use each opportunity to learn a little bit more about yourself and of course the profession, you can build on that, right? So it's like step, step, step. And it's uh, not a linear path like we talked about, but it's more, sometimes it's like mountain climbing. So you're going up one way and you're like, oh, big rock. <laughs> I need to grab onto that. That's going to be helpful. Or you might need to uh, sidestep a little bit. It also sounds a little bit like a dance. Like, okay, I moved from here and here and that taught me this. And so I took this move and and then I was offered this uh, dance partner over here. And, and I, it's all kind of eloquent and, and really beautiful. And I think it shows how integrated all parts of our professions really can be. I mean, when you're talking about one area of marketing and advertising that's becoming more and more specialized, I think, as you go down your path. But the multiple vantage points, I think, really makes you quite the trailblazer. And you have that broader perspective of that big picture that you can tell the story from really being on one side of the house, you're part of the sports organization, and then the other side where you're part of the nonprofit. And you know what each party is really kind of looking for. Yeah. And so you can speak to that. It's really great. It's been extremely helpful. And I'll say even just from, you know, what we haven't talked about yet, which is the most critical aspect of partnership marketing and communications from this realm. And it's the personal relationships, you know, with the people that I'm so fortunate to work with at the league. And so the point you made, what's been really helpful and critical is that I can understand what my colleagues on the league side are going through and, and I know what questions to ask and I know what's maybe a reach in terms of what to ask for. And I also know what to appreciate, you know, when they're able to get things done that are above and beyond, you know, our partnership mm -hmm. agreement, because I know what it took to get there. So it absolutely has been a tremendous help to understand their perspective and having been on that side. And again, just underscore your point about your career and, and no job situation is ever a mistake because it all adds up to this bigger depth and breadth of understanding uh, as you're going along your journey, which is, yes, absolutely not linear. It's it's up and down for sure. <laughs> it's a climb, it's a fall, it's a dance, it's all kinds of things for sure. Well, let's talk about advertising and then we'll, we'll get more into the American Cancer Society and your work there. But in terms of advertising, you have been award-winning and your advertising really resonated with fans of national brands. So how do you approach creating advertising campaigns that really resonate with the brand followers? Yeah, so really during my time at the Spurs, I'd say, I mean, what a great brand and organization to work for that had such a history of really built trust among their target audience, which is their fan base, of course. So the period and the awards we were fortunate to win as a team there with the Spurs 
were really a result and a reflection of us listening to our audience, our fans, and taking what we saw from them about how they identified themselves with being a Spurs fan. And it goes back to that understanding your target and then really understanding what brand identity is all about, which is do your target audience, those folks that you're looking to reach, do they really relate to you? Do they associate themselves and their identity with what you represent, with your value attributes as a brand? So I'd say that's really the impetus for the success that we had there in San Antonio was understanding that, that this is about more than just a sports team for a lot of our fans. Again, that psychology that just really intrigues my interest is it's tapping into someone in their own personal identity. And I think that's also where having been in their shoes, having been a sports fan myself, that inspiration for me when I was young and following the Atlanta Braves, I could relate to that. I could relate to being a fan and feeling a sense of pride and confidence and identity through that association with my team. So I think it was first understanding that dynamic and the brand identity and how our target audience viewed us that allowed us to create campaigns like Spurs Family when I was there, which was one of the, the ads that we won an award for. It was, um, it was really a nod to the fans and understanding that we were not just their team of choice. We were really their family. And when they saw us display those attributes that the Spurs became known for in terms of the character, of the team and obviously led by Coach Pop and and the culture there, that was something that fans valued as much as the championships and and the wins and the losses. That's a great example about the Spurs family. I I literally still have a Spurs family (laughs) t-shirt that my Spurs friends gave me and it was special to me. And, you know, family is the top value around the globe. So I can absolutely I testify and say that is great and fantastic and, and resonates. And, and you're right. The pride in the team can trickle over to the pride in the community. Mm-hmm. And I've certainly seen that here in San Antonio that, you know, when our team's doing great, boy, people are so happy. Mm-hmm. And there was a great corporation, Valero, who would offer free coffee yeah. on the morning. You remember when the Spurs would win and boy, people were so happy to go get that coffee, which what cost cents, right? It was less than a dollar, <laughs> but it was something about that. That was free. And we all came together in the morning. You got your coffee. Mm-hmm. And then if we, the Spurs didn't win, you know, that Friday morning, you were like, whoa, <laughs> everyone's just a little sadder. So I think that is great because part of what these brands can really do for communities, help them feel like they matter. That's right. And bring pride to them. So that's great. I love that you share that. So your work at the American Cancer Society now means you're a global representative and you have that global vantage point. How does engaging at that level impact your marketing work now? It's just such a privilege. I mean, again, to be with an organization over a hundred years old, I mean, you're really the trusted leader in the fight against cancer across the country. And then to your point, globally through our partnerships with the major cancer organizations of over 30 countries around the globe. And so it's certainly a privilege to represent that, the history, the legacy that is the American Cancer Society. But one of the things that we continue to focus on internally is how are we continue to push that forward? So it's certainly, again, a privilege to have built that trust over 100 plus years. We want to make sure that we are continuing to use a sports term, move the ball down the field as it relates to celebrating the progress that we've made in the fight against cancer and survival rates going up in various forms of cancer, but also really highlighting the major challenges and barriers that still exist. And one of the things we're very focused on as the American Cancer Society representing the fabric of America and the diversity of our beautiful country is the fact that health disparities exist and that we, we're seeing lower survival rates in under-resourced, marginalized communities. And it's one of the things our sports league partners are very aligned and focused with us on as well. So I think the beauty of being able to be that global leader and certainly every country faces a different challenge, but then also really recognizing some of the challenges we still face here at home and being able to continue to evolve our focus to meet those challenges. So health equity, obviously a major focus for us. Uh, Prevention in general, a major focus for us. We're seeing more survivors because we're seeing more people that are able to catch cancer early. And we're seeing more people that are 
through our amazing research, able to understand what some of those risk reduction factors are. I'll mention one that I wasn't even aware of before American Cancer Society and this portion of my life and experience, and it was the health and wellness aspect that's related to cancer risk reduction. A lot of people think of it as eating a healthy diet and maintaining a healthy weight for a risk of heart disease. It's actually, you know, an aspect of reducing the risk of many preventable forms of cancer as well. So things like that, that we're working to continue to impress upon the people, you know, of this country and working with our partners globally, because obviously, again, if you can prevent it or catch it early, that's the best path to survival. So just a little bit, again, of what we're focused on. I'd also say that as an organization, we're very, very heavily involved in advocacy as well, bipartisan perspective. And one of the benefits I think we have in, in our cause is that cancer and the fight against cancer is something that touches everyone in some way, virtually. And because of that, we have a lot of support on both sides of the aisle in, in DC, federally and locally. So we're doing advocacy work to extend access to cancer care for those that are battling cancer. Uh, and I just love that, that element of the work that we do also. So it's certainly the research, which we're known for and breakthrough treatments but it's also the advocacy work and it's also the patient support. So those that are going through their cancer journey right now, how are we really reaching out to support them? And our 24 seven hotline is something that a lot of people are aware of, which again, all of this funding goes to support. So I could clearly talk for quite a while about <laughs> all of the work that we're doing and just the scope, but you know, again, just really inspired by the work we're doing, happy and thankful to really have partners and supporters our donors and our volunteers are in the millions around the country. And so we're really privileged to have a great uh, support system. That's fantastic. I love how you are really thinking all the way around some of the challenges those who have been diagnosed with cancer may face, because like you mentioned, the advocacy part's going to be important when there's policies in place that can help us, that can make a world of difference. And when there's policies in place that get in our way, they can create new barriers, especially when you're not doing well, feeling well, that, you know, can be overwhelming. And the hotline is something that I think is fantastic because how accessible is that? Yeah. So I applaud you all for that. Thanks. And I should also mention the caregivers, because I think a lot of times we are so focused on fighting the disease and those that are battling the disease. But I think the reason our reach and our community is so strong is because there's a caregiver, there's a multiple family of caregivers behind every person that's diagnosed with cancer. So we really want to do a lot of work to support them and uplift them. And a lot of our ambassadors, whether it's our player ambassadors, we have been fortunate to work with celebrities and talent ambassadors, really who have been caregivers to someone in their family or in their friendship circle who's gone through it. I think that side is also something we enjoy, really being able to uplift and support caregivers and and motivate them and celebrate the work that they're doing. That's smart for a number of reasons. Like you pointed out, the caregivers themselves, they play a key role in how a patient, right? The person with cancer can really do well if they have supportive caregivers and they're more likely to be optimistic and really get some of the support that they need as they go through their journey. And then oftentimes in families, unfortunately, some of these genes were passed on and that caregiver may have some health challenges of their own. And so just being educated and know that they can have the resources they have in the American Cancer Society is quite beautiful. So I love that. Well, I want to ask you, Sherry, you are definitely a trailblazer in my eyes in all the work you're doing, but particularly in marketing for our friends who are listening on that side of the house. Are there some key lessons that you would share yeah, and this is actually going to bring me back to another hat that I have worn over the past few years, which has been fortunate enough to be an adjunct professor, first at NYU in integrated marketing uh, the, the fall that I joined American Cancer Society, which was interesting because that meant a lot of trips back and forth, but an amazing experience. Probably, I would say, one of the heights of my career, being able to really, you take for granted what you're learning over the course of your career. And when you're able to share that knowledge and see students really inspired by that knowledge, it's been, again, one of the, the heights of my career and, and I think the best way. So I've been able to contribute. So with my professor hat on, and then I've taught a two-week course at UCLA. But yeah, it really starts with knowing your target audience. You know, whenever you're starting and embarking on any sort of marketing campaign, who are you speaking to and 
and what's ultimately your business objective. I know whether it's revenue, which it, it typically is both on the for-profit and the nonprofit side. So those are really the two keys that you really want to establish to build out any marketing strategy. It starts there, working with students, talk to them a lot about what I love, which is the psychological dynamic of marketing. And we'll start out with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is very psychological study and understanding, but directly translates to how marketing is built. And so the pyramid of understanding the basic needs that we all need to have met as human beings in this world from shelter and food. And, you know, the pyramid goes all the way up to self-actualization, love and belonging, each of those traits in terms of what we need. And then we'll talk about a few brands and give examples of brands and what needs they're tapping into. Again, just goes back to that psychology and understanding of your target audience, because that's the first path to reaching them with a message that's going to get through and that's going to speak to those needs. So I'd say, again, just from a marketing strategy standpoint, everything that we do really comes back to that foundation. I probably talk about the hierarchy of needs at least every week, <laughs> particularly around when you'd mentioned about preventative health and wellness care and work, is that sometimes it's really, really hard to move that needle in because of where people are with their actual everyday lives, right? Yep. And so explaining that and say, meet them where they are. Exactly. And I love that you mentioned really tapping into, are you serving that need? Because if you are, then maybe they can move on up to the next ring of that mm -hmm. ladder or pyramid. And as they advance themselves, they'll be more in love with your brand. They will appreciate that brand. That's right. And we also go through a lot of mistakes as we talked about trial and error. I think from understanding and learning marketing, it's good to look at some brand mistakes and they're out there, maybe a miss in terms of brands that were attempting to reach a certain audience but didn't do the back end research. And part of that research is we talk a lot about focus groups, particularly when we talk about marketing in diverse settings. And obviously there's a lot of buzz right now and, and has been really over the past, I'd say 15 years to recognizing the changing diversity of our country and marketers looking to promote and market to different cultures. So I'd say that's also something that I talk to my students about and that we look at is what are those brands that have maybe had a miss and attempted to reach a certain group and inadvertently ended up potentially insulting that group or not really reaching them in the way they intended. So I think marketing as well and learning it is, you know, look at some of those brands that have had a misstep and try to diagnose it so that you can avoid it in your campaigns. Yeah, there's that history of the work, all those case studies, they'll tell you and they leave very important clues about what to do and what not to do. And, and that's really important that you're actually that ongoing student and are continuing to learn about the profession as our society is becoming more evolved, our terminology is more involved, our sentiment around things are evolving. So I think that's really important you bring that up, Cherie. So I really love how your work promotes social good with ties to health equity, social responsibility, and community relations. So that really seems like a constant in your career. Yeah, it's interesting because like I said, I came full circle without necessarily planning on it. But when I originally thought about pursuing a career in sports, taking me back to grad school at this point in Dallas and looked at a front office, that was my goal at the time was I want to work in a front office for a professional sports team. And when I looked at all of the different parts of the front office and connected that to the bachelor's degree I got in psychology, I identified community at that point as the best really hybrid of my interest in psychology and people. And if I had it to do all over again, I always tell people I might have even gotten a sociology degree because it's that interaction with different groups that really interests me. So it was combining what I knew was that core interest with new interest in doing and applying that to sports really from early on helped me to realize that the community side is what I was most interested in. I then took that, I'm so thankful that it happened that way and evolved it to marketing because that helped me understand really the business side of community and, and driving behaviors among certain target audiences, again, and, and community groups. So I evolved through the marketing space and made my way back to the community side. So I'd say it really was always an interest of mine just based on family background. I come from a family of very interested activists in terms of society. And uh, we talk all the time in family meetings or get togethers about 
what's happening in the world. And so I think I've always had that foundation of wanting to make a difference and an impact, which is what the community and the social responsibility side speaks to me the most. So yeah, it really is something I think that's been embedded in me always and really privileged to be able to express it in my career now. I know in DEI and B work, they use the term intersectionality quite a bit. And, you know, if you think about it, that's kind of what you're describing. Like we have multiple parts of our identity. There's parts that come together and intersect and support each other. And there's a synergy there. And I think you found that in your career. So that's awesome. And I I really hope it inspires some other people to think a little deeper about the work they're doing. You know, if we think about marketing, there's different ways to define marketing, but if you think about it, like it's really about promoting something positive Mm -hmm. and you're certainly doing that in your work. Yeah. One thing I'll add to that, just because it was another amazing experience in my career that underscore what you were saying about marketing and and how ultimately it all ties back to doing some good. It, It should, if it's good marketing. So I was privileged enough to serve on the jury in Cannes Lions International Creative Festival in in the south of France. So I say all of that just to say that with the jury representatives from marketing agency and brand across the world, as we sat and evaluated all of the marketing campaigns that were submitted for sports marketing awards that year, I will say that the majority of the awards that bubbled up to the top made some sort of impact in addition to driving the business forward. So driving business forward is obviously key. We will not be in business unless we're actually driving the business side and you know producing revenue. But being able to connect that to actually doing good were the campaigns that bubbled up to the top in terms of excellence. So it solidified for me, and you talk a lot about community and people don't often think that there's really a marketing aspect to the work. And so that solidified that, you know, some of the best marketing work is actually marketing work that's driving business and purpose. Oh, I love that you highlight that because sometimes what I get a sense of is that some organizations may feel like community or helping community is a cost. And what you're saying is, no, that's quite a gain. That's the mark of excellence. And I absolutely agree. That'll be the mark of excellence as we go forward, because our community really expects that engagement Mm -hmm. and our world really needs that support. Exactly. Well, this has been really fun and I'm like blown away by you, Sheree. I'm like, where have you not been? It's been (laughs) fantastic to catch up with you and we'll have to continue this, but I like to ask all my guests and I'm really interested in your opinion. What does smart talk mean to you? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I'll start out with one of the pillars that I think has guided me, whether it's through the education on into career. And it is this notion that education, intelligence, it's really about how to think as opposed to what to think. So I think about that when I think about smart talk. I think it's, you know, that whole notion of being smart. It's not about what you think and mimicking others and and their thoughts and their ideologies, but it's about asking the right questions. It's about learning the right lessons from life. It is this notion of be curious, which is a continuous journey over the course of your life, both on the personal and professional side. So smart talk for me means someone who knows how to think and not necessarily what to think, meaning that they're constantly questioning, learning, evolving, and uh, being curious. That's one of my favorite answers so far. <laughs> Be curious. Yeah. Because you're absolutely right. If you think you know it all, well, okay. That's your knowledge right. stops today. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And some of the best leaders, I listen to a CMO podcast and a lot of different podcasts in the business side. And some of the leaders I enjoy hearing from the most are leaders that talk about what they've learned from their teams. Uh, and we talked about it a little bit earlier in the conversation and recognizing that you know, the workforce and not only is the target audience evolving with Gen Z, but Gen Z is coming into the workforce. And if you're going to be a leader of the next generation, are you listening to them? Are you pulling knowledge and insights from their life experience? Again, are you learning how they think and challenging how you think so that you can continue to grow? Absolutely. Fantastic. So Sheree, this is a fantastic conversation. What's the best way for our listeners to connect with you? 
Yes. Well, in this social media world that we live in, and I'm a marketer, so you can find me certainly on LinkedIn. My Twitter is my first name and last name. Welcome anyone who's interested in continuing the conversation to follow me on Twitter as well and look forward to just continuing to engage. But thank you for having me and for welcoming me to this conversation and happy to contribute. Thank you, Cherie. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us today. Thanks so much, Melissa. We love diving deep into communication topics to elevate our industry practice. If you'd like to go deeper, you can work with me as a trainer, consultant, or hire my firm for strategic communication planning or PR strategy services. And get ready. My book, Smart Talk, Public Relations Essentials, All Pro Should Know, comes out next week. You can read all about it and sign up to be the first to know when it drops at mvw360.com slash book. And as always, think smart and communicate smart. And I'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Smart Talk series. If you learned something or enjoyed our conversation, share on social media or send to a friend. To learn more about this and other communication topics, visit mvw360.com. That's mvw360.com.